I'm on the committee that um, pulled this together, and, and this whole thing is sponsored by the Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, Inclusion and what's this? Community. Community. Community Office on our campus. Edit. <laughs> Edit, yeah, okay. So I would like to start with the land acknowledgement. As we gather here to honor Jews who did and did not survive the Shoah or Holocaust, we must take time to recognize the Duwamish and Coast Salish tribes on whose land this college resides. Though we as Jews have suffered, have also suffered from land and cultural displacement, we acknowledge how we as non-indigenous people in this land have benefited from colonial displacement and harm. As we come together on this day, we want to explicitly show solidarity with communities that have been the target of genocide, violence, and attempted erasure. We encourage participants to consider their responsibilities to the people and the land, both here and elsewhere, and to stand in solidarity with Native, Indigenous, and First Nations people and their sovereignty, cultural heritage, and lives. In that vein, <clears throat> we encourage all to make a donation to Real Rent Duwamish, and you can Google that to uh, find out more about the work they're doing, and find additional ways to make your solidarity and allyship actionable. Let us commit to learning their history and the histories of all people who have been subjected to genocide so we can make the words never again a reality. Okay, so the reason we're here right now in this room, and there's, there are more things to see in the other room when you have time, um, we're here to uh, hear Dr. Tom Heller, and by the way, that's not a PhD doctorate, that is medical doctor. I'm delighted to introduce Tom Heller, although I will let him tell you what he wants you to know about himself, I will simply list a few of his accomplishments to give you a sense of who he is. Tom is a public service doctor, HIV AIDS expert, which led him to share his knowledge and skills in Cambodia, Ethiopia, and South Africa, mostly while working for the US Center for Disease Control, and we got to visit him in all those countries, so that was great. He loves to act, and he plays cello, and most importantly, he is a wonderful, caring human being, father, grandfather, and friend. And I am fortunate to have him as one of my closest friends, Tom. Thank you so much, Patty. That was an excessive introduction. But um, it's an honor to be with you today to commemorate the Holocaust. And the reason I was invited was to share with you the story of one person who endured the Holocaust from the beginning of World War II through to its end as a prisoner in a number of concentration camps um, uh, of the Nazis. Uh, so um, the person, let me just make sure I'm doing this right, yeah. So this is my father, the, so that person is my father, Paul Heller, uh, who was pictured there on the left uh, in the 1930s. He was born a few days after the onset of World War I, and he died a few days after 9-11 uh, in our country. Um, and this is a picture of me. I'm not sure how well it's, it's, uh, you can see it. Me, back 34 years ago, with him on a visit that he made to Seattle. Um, before I tell you his story, it's really important for me to share why I feel uh, it's so important to share his story. He was a lucky one. He credits luck with getting him through the entire duration of the war. Because of his luck, I had the good fortune to come to exist, unlike six million other Jews who, who's, who never had descendants to share the stories of their father and parents. Um, and also, hate. My parents were the victims of hate, unchecked hate. And hate is rising in our own country. Just this past Sunday, Temple de Hirsch Sinai 
a few blocks from here was painted with was spray painted with anti-Semitic garbage, and uh, we can't ignore this. This cannot go unchecked. And so I'm hoping stories uh, of the Holocaust uh, remind each of us that we must combat hate wherever we see it. Um, I'm uh, in in this presentation. You will actually see my father on video. He was uh, back in the 90s. Steven Spielberg, the well-known director, um, set a project which he called the Shoah Project, in which he uh, uh, sought to um, gain oral histories of as many survivors of the Holocaust as he could, and thousands of people were interviewed, including my father. So you will see snippets of him talking about his experience. I'm also uh, so uh, grateful to the uh, Holocaust Center for Humanity for gathering uh, corroborative information and providing some photos that I didn't have, and then there'll also be photos of my own. So, uh, getting to my father's story, he grew, uh, is there a point? Or I, uh, well, uh, he grew up in what was, at the time of his birth, Bohemia, but after World War I became Czechoslovakia and uh, now is divided between the Czech Republic and the country of Slovakia. Um, so uh, he w his hometown was this town Komatau, uh, now called Komatov, uh, very close to the German border. Uh, do I have a, a pointer or is, maybe I can, uh. a anyway, it doesn't matter. You can see the, the uh, Czech, the, the German border just a few miles from Komatau. So it was a town of about 20,000 people, um, about 65 miles from the capital of Prague. And this, these were my grandparents, Alfred and Elsa Heller. Alfred was the, was the uh, very highly respected doctor in Komatau. And my father told stories as a boy, he would go in a horse and buggy with his father on house calls. And that was perhaps, and that increased his uh, ties to his father and uh, may have been a factor in his own decision to pursue medicine. This photo on the left, I took myself in Komata. The, this house, this building here, is, was my was uh, the the bottom floor the front of the first floor was my grandfather's doctor office and the family lived on the two upper floors. I took this picture on my first trip to Europe uh, in 1970 and I took it from down the street. I was reluctant to take it in front of the building lest I see the purported owner of that building uh, uh, who might come out to see why is someone taking a photo. That was our house. That was my family's house, and we were never compensated for it. And I just didn't, I wanted to avoid con, uh, dealing with the person who presently owns it. So my father, there's my father at, in either kindergarten or first grade. He was the um, only Jew in his class, and, um, and he spent his entire childhood in Komatau. I heard many stories about about life in Komata, which I don't have time to share now. Um, but he, and he, so he graduated from the gymnasium, the equivalent of high school plus one year of college, in 1933 and decided to pursue medicine in the footsteps of his father. So then this was him during his medical school days. And um, so he, he uh, went from Komata to Prague to the Charles University Medical School. Um, and there he met Lisa Florsheim, and as it says there, she would years later become my mom. Um, uh, she was actually from Germany, uh, from Frankfurt, Germany, and she uh, uh, entered university in 1933, shortly after Adolf Hitler became chancellor in Germany. One of the first acts that he did was um, to forbid Jews to attend universities in Germany. So she had to go someplace else, and the Charles University Medical School was taught in German, so that's where she ended up, uh, where she went to school. 
My father was smitten with her, but for various reasons kept it to himself for many years. Uh, meanwhile, between 1933 and 1938, it was becoming increasingly dangerous to be in Czechoslovakia. Germany was right next door. Hitler was, was uh, committing terrible acts of anti-Semitism, and there was the sense that war was imminent. Many of my father's friends left, um, but my father didn't graduate from medical school until late 1938. His mother was ill, and for other reasons, he did not choose to leave. But my mom, or Lisa Florsheim, uh, was worried, and she was able to uh, immigrate in 1938 to America. Um, just before she departed, my father decided this is the only time I have. He had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with her about his own feelings, and she, to maybe, maybe to, her to his surprise, um, was receptive and said that she would do everything she could once she got to America to help him get there. Well, it turned out all those fears my mother had and my father's friends had were justified because in March of 1939, Hitler just marched into Czechoslovakia. And this is him on the left, that is him, uh, on the grounds of the, castle, uh, of the castle in Prague. I have walked those very steps. And here on the right are uh, Nazi soldiers marching through the streets of Prague. I'm going to let my father tell you what happened. Now let's see how I, how do I do this? I was arrested in the meantime as a because I was as a as a student in Prague. I was in a German student's anti-Nazi movement and the Nazis had registered every name and uh, soon after the, the, the Germans moved into Prague they arrested me. I wasn't terribly active, I just went to meetings and uh, wore a badge to show that I was uh, an anti-Nazi which was enough to insult some of the, the students which had, had become already mainly Nazis. So he, he spent a number of days in uh, Prague prison and on his release he was told by the Nazis who now controlled that prison that he was a marked man, that he had better uh, leave the country or he may face serious consequences. Well it wasn't so easy to do and he, um, it took months to get the proper papers to be able to go to England, and, and, uh, but he finally secured those, and I'm going to uh, have him tell you what happened next. I had my plane reservations for early September from Prague to, to London, but on the 1st of September war broke out, and the Gestapo arrested everybody who was known to them, on who, of whom they had a record. And so I, early in the morning, on the 1st of September, there was the, they rang the bell in my home. It was 3 o'clock in the morning, and the Gestapo was there. And, but when, when they took me and, and we arrived at the prison, there was already the news that Hitler had started the war again. That was the last time I saw my mother. And uh, so from day one of World War II, he was incarcerated. Um, he spent about a week in a prison in Prague and then was transported to Dachau, where he spent two weeks, and, but thereafter he was sent by cattle car to Buchenwald. Uh, where he would remain for the next three and a half years. I don't know how well you can see this. This is a fragment from his uniform. I have it right here. This is a fragment from the uniform he wore in 1939. I don't know how long he wore this 
particular uniform. The triangle, the, everybody had a classification and um, it was uh, distinguished by badges that people wore. My father's was initially um, classified as a political prisoner and that's represented by a red triangle. The T, whoops, what happened? I'm sorry, what happened here? The T stands for Czechoslovakia, which in German starts with a T. Um, it, I believe, I only f was, I found this in a box after my father's death, and I don't know really the, how it came to be a, a cut out like this, uh, but I think uh, the badge was replaced, his classification was changed to Jew, and he wore a yellow star, but I don't know for sure. So uh, the upper picture is um, where he was first, the first work assignment he had, which was in a stone quarry shoveling rocks. And this was backbreaking work. He described it as the worst, worst assignment in the camp. And he labored there for weeks or months until he was absolutely exhausted and malnourished, lost weight, uh, and he had, uh, this is one place where luck played a big role in his survival. He developed a severe pain in his neck, such that he felt he couldn't go on, and he felt close to death. And so he thought, I have nothing to lose, I'm going to the infirmary to see a Nazi doctor. Well, the Nazi doctor he saw had seen a number of cases of this kind of neck pain, which is due to a fracture, which actually had the name a shoveler's fracture. And, and uh, he thought he could make a name for himself by, dis by discovering uh, appropriate treatments for this. So he put my father in a complete body cast and put him in a bed in a special unit in the infirmary. And the luck that he, my father had was that this doctor was reassigned a few days later to another camp and my father was sort of left alone and somewhat forgotten about is what I can tell because he spent weeks in that bed getting decent nutrition, getting rest and getting uh, restoring his energy so that he could go back to this horrible labor. Once they, and so after a number of weeks they realized there was no reason for him to be there and they sent him back to the quarry. Um, fortunately, and I don't know how different assignments were made, but he had other assignments that were less rigorous, but they were all a form of torture. Um, he talked about uh, having to run with a bucket of, of heavy stones on a stick with another person, run 200 meters, dump the bucket return and just gather more stones and do that over and over again for no reason. That was a form of torture that he ex endured. In any case, he, he, was, uh, he spent three and a half years there in Buchenwald with horrible labor uh, as his main activity. In, um, eight, in the spring of 1943, Prisoners in Buchenwald started being called at the roll call, named, and sent to Auschwitz. On April 19th of that year, my father's name came up. He was to be d deported to Auschwitz. The deported, he was sent, sent to Auschwitz. Am I in that? So this is about a 350 mile trip. It could be done in one day or one and a half days. It was very odd. Um, th th and this is another place where luck played an incredible role in his survival. Um, it was uh, about 12 prisoners were put on a commercial train with 12 SS guards. This was sort of a vacation, rest and relaxation for these SS guards. Instead of sending them him directly to the camp on this commercial train with citizen with German citizens uh, in on the train with them, they would go for an hour or two on the train, get out in a in a town, bring the prisoners to the local jail, and have a night of drinking and fun on the town. Uh, and they did this repeatedly over a number of days. They arrived on a Friday 
at, at a, in a town close to Auschwitz. They did the usual thing. They brought the prisoners to the jail and then went out. And uh, the jailer turned out to be an anti-Nazi. And he lived close enough to Auschwitz to know just what happened there. He read my father's dossier, the, the records that accompanied him, and he was very worried. And in the evening of that day, he came to the, uh, the uh, my father shared a cell with another Buchenwald prisoner who had a similar dossier. He was worried about these two prisoners, that they, if the guards read the dossier, that they would be sent to the gas chamber. They were in reasonably good shape physically. They were young men. And um, if they didn't read it, they would likely go to the labor camp. Um, he, they, this was a Friday. He said, I'm going to try and convince the guards to, keep, to stay in town another day so that you arrive on a Sunday morning rather than a Saturday morning. Because Saturday night, these guards go out and get drunk. And um, they might be hung over and be careless and not look at your records. I'm going to let my father tell you what happened. Again. Oh, before that, though, just a word about Auschwitz. You know, this is the way selections were done. I, if you can see it, the tower there is the entrance to Auschwitz. At the entrance, people were selected, either to go to one line or the other. The one line had basically healthy uh, men of young and middle age. In the right, there were ba children, women, and old people. These people on, on the left in the slide um, were hours or minutes away from their death. 1.1 million people had that fate in Auschwitz. This is a close-up of that line, and you see children and women. And my father could easily have been in that line. So my father arrived on April 25th, which was a Sunday. Um, the, he was given this tattoo, and the Holocaust Center for Humanity was able to document from his number uh, his arrival date. This was a kind of receipt that Auschwitz sent back to Buchenwald. They were very careful with their records. Uh, my father was kind of merchandise, and this is an acknowledgment to Buchenwald. Uh, you see here that went back to Buchenwald, that he was received with his whatever belongings he had. So now I'm going to, you can hear what happened to him. We knew already by, by the grapevine, we learned in Buchenwald that anybody who arrives in Auschwitz is killed right away or sent into the camp to work. And I said, well, you go to, this, to the mining camp in Javorno and set up a hospital there. Wow. And that's what, that's what happened. And I was a, 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 for the next one and a half years in that camp, worked as a doctor and did a lot of good, I thought. So instead of what could have happened, he didn't even have to go to a labor camp. He, came, he became somewhat of a privileged uh, prisoner and worked as a doctor in this satellite camp, sub-camp, Jaworzno, about 30 miles from the main camp. And uh, it wasn't an easy life. He worked very hard. He'd sometimes have to see a hundred people. Uh, he, is, uh, he didn't have the best of nutrition, but he didn't have to do the hard labor that the other prisoners did, and that certainly uh, had a big role in his survival. Um, I do think he, he did do a lot of good, um, just as a uh, at his memorial service in Chicago, after an obituary appeared in the Chicago paper, two people came to his memorial service that I didn't know, and they came up to him, to me, and introduced themselves. They had been prisoners in Jaworzno. And they uh, accredited my father with saving their lives. So, he was there for a year and a half. In, um, 
in January of 1945. It looked very bad for the Germans. They were losing the war. The Russians were coming from the east, and the, um, the, uh, the, the Nazis decided to evacuate Auschwitz and the, all the satellite camps. Uh, this was the, what happened was described by Elie Wiesel in his book, Night. All of the prisoners were marched in January in Poland through the horrible winter conditions, uh, marched east, uh, westward um, uh, uh, along with the, the, the Nazi staff of the, of the, of the uh, concentration camp. Uh, they, of course, had tents and had uh, warm, warm clothes, but the prisoners had miserable uh, conditions, very bad footwork, etc. I will, I will. So this was a march from Dachau, which is in southern Germany, in the spring, in March of 1945. Springtime, very different conditions, but the one photo we, we could access showing the march. I'm going to let my father again describe that experience. What happened to, the, to the, most of the people, the same thing would happen to me. We were evacuated when the Germans, when the Russians came close, and we marched for more than two weeks to, to a camp west of uh, Auschwitz in, in Germany. Groß Rosen in Silesia. Probably not more than 20% of the people who started arrived in that camp. My father was not one to uh, express his emotions, so he described in arithmetic terms what happened on that march. 3,000 people started that march. 2,400 perished over that, over that 17 day period. Walking, walking 156 miles uh, to Gross Rosen. Um, they were they you know, from from hypothermia, from exhaustion. People collapsed and then were shot. People didn't get up in the morning after sleeping in a barn, and if they were still alive, they were shot. My father I mean, that was just a one more hellish experience over a almost six year period. So at, at Gross Rosen, my father learned that he was going back to Buchenwald, which he was glad of because he knew people there. He wanted to, he had friends, he hoped they had survived. And uh, so he was uh, initially very grateful that that was going to be his destination. When he got there, what he found were prisoners in horrible condition. He himself was sick. He got typhus on this, on this march, which makes you very ill. And so he was admitted to this infirmary where over a number of, in fe, this was in February, and over a number of weeks he got better. And um, then he started helping attend to the sick people. He had been working as a doctor, so he started helping uh, care for the, the, the sick people in this infirmary. Well, in April, the war was essentially over. Um, and uh, in early April, the Nazis in the camp left for fear that they would be arrested. And so they disappeared. And the camp was left to the prisoners. My father, being a doctor, was uh, busy attending to these sick people in, the, in this building, which was the building in the very front of the camp. The very first building you encounter in Buchenwald was this building. And um, uh, on April 11th, the camp was liberated. This is Dwight David Eisenhower, who was in charge of the entire army in Europe uh, at, uh, at the time and later became our 34th president. This is him at one of the sub camps of Buchenwald on the day of the liberation. Uh, on April 12th, the next day, a car pulled up and um, I'm going to ask that we, we change the volume. Um, uh, a car pulled up and a man got out uh, and it turned out 
to be Edward R. Murrow, who some of you may know of, but others of you may not. He was one of the most important war correspondents during World War II, and then in the 50s had a huge role uh, in American politics uh, related to the McCarthy era, but I don't have time to go into that. He was, a, and he was from Washington State. I think he grew up in Edison or someplace close to there, and uh, the Washington State uh, uh, School of Journalism or Communications is named after him. Well, he pulled up, and um, the, and he got a tour of, of Buchenwald, and, uh, um, which later was broadcast. So I'm gonna, you're going to hear now that broadcast, some of that broadcast. And listen very carefully because the sound is not very good. Go ahead. Permit me to tell you what you would have seen and heard had you been with me on Thursday. It will not be pleasant listening. If you're at lunch, or if you have no appetite to hear what Germans have done, now is a good time to switch off the radio. For I propose to tell you of Buchenwald. Men and boys reached out to touch me. They were in rags and the remnants of uniforms. Death had already marked many of them, but they were smiling with their eyes. I told him soon, and asked to see one of the barracks. It happened to be occupied by Czechoslovakia. When I entered, men crowded around, tried to lift me to their shoulders. They were too weak. Many of them could not get out of bed. I was told that this building had once stabled 80 horses. There were 1,200 men in it, five to a bunk. The stink was beyond all description. They called the doctor. We inspected his records. There were only names in the little black book, nothing more. Nothing who these men were, what they had done, or hoped. Behind the names of those who had died, there was a cross. I counted them. They totaled 242. 242 out of 1,200 in one month. As I walked down to the end of the barracks, there was applause from the men too weak to get out of bed. It sounded like the hand clapping of babies. They were so weak. The doctor's name was Paul Heller. So this broadcast uh, was uh, aired on the radio on April 15th in England and in America. My mother heard it in New York. My father, my uncle, my father's brother, heard it in London. That was the first they knew he had survived World War II. Uh, two days later, Murrow's secretary came back to the camp with an armful of telegrams from my mother, my uncle, and many friends. And um, my father described that as the most joyous day of his life. Uh, he knew he had uh, a future. And, um, you know, that was uh, an enormous moment for him. But he was, uh, there were all these sick people in the, in the, uh, in that horse stall, horse, uh, uh, you know, that, that infirmary, and um, they needed help. My, because this building was at the front of the camp, my father had access to the office, the American officers, and he asked that um, um, if the medical people associated with the army uh, could set up a, a proper medical facility, uh, and they agreed to do that, and there was a castle 10 miles away, this castle, Blankenheim Castle, where they set up a medical unit. And so my father spent the next weeks going back and forth between the, the camp and this castle, helping transport patients and caring for patients um, who were hanging by a thread, and hopefully lots of them survived. He was in a pickle. He had no passport. He was a displaced person. He had, it's, uh, I have a slide of it, he had this identification card, provisional identification card for civilian internee of Buchenwald. This is not a passport. He, with it, he could get into a displaced persons camp, but that might mean months or even years before he could go uh, really immigrate anywhere. 
Um, but because of his connection to the U.S. Army, they they took they appreciated what he was doing, and they agreed to smuggle him when they left the when they left the camp to to leave the country. They, they were going to go to Paris first, and they smuggled him to Paris. This was months after. This was actually in September uh, after the April liberation. They smuggled him to Paris where he could go and get a passport at the Czech embassy. So that's his, that's his, uh, that's his passport. And I have it here on the table. Um, and with that, he was able to secure a visa to England. It was, that this was him at that time. So he was able to get a visa to England and um, that was good and for for six months and so um, he spent six months in England with my uncle and um, on March 29th he got an immigration visa to the US it was marked with a very modest looking stamp but this was his ticket to a future and um, just at the end of the six-month period, he was able to get a um, a, a board a, a cargo ship called called the Cape Igvac, which had about six room for about six passengers. The rest of it was cargo. It was a small boat, but he used it to sp and spend about 15 days traveling to New York, where he was met by my mother Lisa Florsheim. Uh, they had had a very uh, lengthy correspondence in that six-month period, each of them pouring their hearts out to each other, and it was sort of a romance by letter, uh, but that's what happened, and four months later they were married. I'm, I'm, we want time, for, and so a lot happened. Um, my father got some medical training. I was born. Uh, my sister was born. Uh, but we're, and then in December of, of 1948, he was the first displaced person to get American citizenship. And this was noted in the Washington, D.C. paper and in the New York Times. And Edward R. Murrow sent him a, a congratulations letter uh, noting that it was December 7th, the seventh anniversary of America's entry into the war. Um, and so I don't have time. He had a distinguished career. He became a research scientist uh, and doctor. He made very significant discoveries around certain blood diseases, including sickle cell anemia. He was awarded a, um, a th this, um, this is it, no, a, the highest honor for, for, um, for medical research in the VA system. He was, um, uh, f uh, was a national award uh, for his uh, research, act research uh, successes. Um, so I'll just end with, uh, with my, my family. I'm, I'm, I have been so lucky because of my father's good luck, I had the chance to live and to produce a wonderful family. Uh, Hitler lost. Uh, we go on. We do have time for comments yeah. and questions. Yeah, we're trying to stay to the, the, you know, if people have to go to classes, we're trying to stay within that framework. So let's take about seven minutes maybe for questions. And Tom is also going to be here afterwards. And after the questions, we're going to uh, do the Morris Cottage, the little ceremony. Uh, so questions of Tom. It always takes a few moments. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, as one more, more survivors pass away, second and third generation people, we have to keep telling their stories. This isn't forgotten because much like the sinking of the Titanic, this is slowly becoming like a historical abstraction and people have no idea of the scale of it, and they have no idea of the impact it had on, on like Jews, on Roma people, on like queer people, and just like how much damage was done, and the scale of it. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, my family had left, part of my family had left um, Eastern Europe, Romania, and the Pila settlement before the Holocaust broke out, but all of our family that didn't immigrate to the States, um, as far as we know, did not survive. And my grandfather was born in 1932. What's interesting enough is that um, the date of his bar mitzvah was the same day in 1945, unbeknownst to him at the time when they were liberating Auschwitz. And um, thank you so much for being here today. It takes time to think of questions, so to, uh, I'm, I'm fine. Paul. Um, I'm curious, uh, just for clarification, when your father was uh, a physician uh, in the infirmary, was it, first of all, was it at first, was it at Auschwitz or at the Birkenau camp? And second, I wonder if you ever learned, either through your father or otherwise, it's always been a point that I've always wondered about, and I've heard a couple answers, but I wonder what your understanding is of the nature of a physician within a place like Auschwitz, or even more so, Birkenau, when after all, the Nazis' intention was to murder the Jews through work or otherwise. Well, it was in neither. He was in this satellite uh, camp uh, Yaworzno that was about 30 miles away that was recently set up upon his, uh, in 1943 when he got there. And um, it, the pr prisoners were doing the Nazis' bidding. I mean, they, whatever, uh, it was some sort of mine and they needed the materials. And so the, it was slave labor that was serving the Nazi cause. Um, and so they did have an interest in having uh, uh, workers who could continue to work. So alas, my father was in s some indirect way contributing to that work, but uh, he was also helping the people who were sick or were injured. Well, you don't have to have questions. <laughs> so if that, if you don't have any more questions, yes. Thank you so much for your talk and for sharing the stories. I'm just wondering, as you grew up in your family, uh, did your father talk <laughs> a lot about this um, horrific That's a good experience and uh, the, the trauma that he went through and others went through? How did you process that as a child and as growing up? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, the answer is no. He never talked about it, but I always knew about it. I always knew the words Buchenwald and Auschwitz. I don't remember not knowing those words. I don't remember not knowing the word Holocaust. Uh, uh, but he never talked about it. And only as a, a but, when, um, when I was 11, I snuck down, I, I was sneaking around in our basement, and I found um, a testim I found an interesting looking document that was from a Senate subcommittee and uh, uh, in a closet in our basement. And um, it was an, an investigation into the uh, life or the actions of the wife of the commandant of Buchenwald, who uh, there were assertions that she had committed war atrocities, war crimes. and. Um, I, we, were, uh, we were living in Washington, D.C. at the time they found my father, uh, and he testified. And I, at age 11, I, I found that testimony, and I read it, and it was like a, a, a light shining on a dark place, uh, and it was horrifying. 
um, and curiously, and I would go back to the basement whenever, frequently, to just sneak a reread of that, uh, because he described torture, and he described awful things that I really shouldn't have seen. Um, so I knew from that, and I never told them, and I never uh, didn't, uh, it was kind of forbidden. You, uh, there was a, a, you know, understanding that my sister and I had that we don't talk about it. But he would often go upstairs after dinner to do his work instead of spending time with us. And uh, my mom would explain he lost six years of his life. He's trying to catch up. So we, you know, that's the kind of, and, but then as an adult, he translated a diary he kept, which actually was published. Uh, Elie Wiesel, he sent this to Elie. He, he uh, was in German. It was about that 17-day march, and um, which he, he had written some little notes. It's too long a story to tell now, but he was able to, after the fact, put it together as daily rec recollections. He translated it into English and shared it with my sister and me when we were in our 20s. Uh, and that, then he started talking more about it. And I asked him to write a memoir uh, uh, when, on his 80th birthday, which he did, which he shared with us, which had a lot of other details in it. But I, I regret there's a lot I don't know, and I wish I had been asked more questions. So that was a long answer, and probably we've run out of time. But thanks for the question. So we have time for maybe one more question. Okay. Thank you. And Tom, as I said, Tom will be here. He's got another presentation. Uh, so you can talk to him if you can stay around. Um, Gator and Jared? Oh. <laughs> I'm going to grab this. Okay, so, look, I'll let Jared see. Well, I think Gator's Okay, first. right, Jared, Gator's first. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, real briefly, um, I'm still a little bit in shock emotionally as well as kind of spiritually from what time to share. Our country has been going through some real dark times. Um, the COVID, I've never seen anything like that. In, our time to spread around the world as quickly as it did. And I don't know about you, but when it had essential workers going to work only and everyone else shelter in place, I think I felt the lonely as getting on a bus with a bus driver and we were the only ones together. I wonder if we were going to survive at all. When we look at situations, I notice that as humans, we've got a tenacity to stand up, be brave, and walk through it. Our Creator, we are made in their image, has a light beyond a thousand suns that pushes straight through the darkness and it's called love. Amen. We can shine that light against any hatred, any bigotry, even if it's something within ourselves that we are dealing with on a daily basis, sometimes depression, sometimes a lot of suicide. We shine the light. It's in response to the Creator because we're in their image. We carry that same power. My challenge to each and every one of you is that 
we have these little tea lights here. And it's a reminder that we carry that light. On your way out, there is a little thing that we call a little flame. And we have a permanent marker. Mark something that you're committed to and that you take away from what Tom has shared, his gift with us, that you want the world to see. And that way, when you go through your dark moments, whether this is in your purse, your pocket, your backpack, or even your pocket, and you just say, I don't think I can do this anymore, pull it out and turn it on back on. That's your commitment. That no matter what, as a people, we will get through this. And love is that answer. Can I? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe clarify. So, yes, we want you to do what Gator just said with these tea lights, and you may take them, of course. But the, the light, the paper flames, yes, that Emily has back there, um, and the markers are back there, and on your way out, even if you have to leave in the midst of all of this, please take one, write on it, what you're, how you're going to shine your light in the world, and, and tape it up on the bulletin board right outside the door. Okay. Now, what we're going to do together, um, representing our family here, we're going to... <laughs> See, that's why I need her glasses. We're going to light this candle together. I strike. Okay. Oh, we'll use a match. And if it doesn't work, we will use your lighter. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Let me take this off. All right. The Mourner's Kaddish, which you'll see on your handout, um, was originally written in Aramaic in the 13th century. It is a prayer which is traditionally said in the Jewish community during a prayer service and every day for the 11 months after losing a loved one. It is often viewed as a prayer which offers praise to God, despite one's own suffering and loss. But quite frankly, people don't really understand what the true meaning of the Mourner's Kaddish is. According to Rabbi Eli Kaufner, it is a prayer which is meant to remind God of the brokenness of the world. It is a critique of a God that has al allowed a world in which people, even those that spent their life in worship, can be killed en masse. Um, if you understand the meaning of the Aramaic text, you'll notice that God isn't mentioned by name. That's on purpose. Um, Rabbi Kofner says, that the first key phrase is the opening line, Yit Gadal Yit Gadash Shemei Rabbah. That's often translated into English as magnified and sanctified be his great name. 
It's understandable how this could be seen as a prayer praising God, but the prayer is not a praise, it is a request. The worshiper is asking for God to be magnified, to be sanctified, implying that God is not magnified and sanctified right now. Because in a world of death and mourning, it is clear that God is not fully holy, great, or even a king. So in reading the mourner's cottage today, we're remembering that all those that lost their lives, to hate, and we're also acknowledging that there is so much left to be done to heal the world. Traditionally, the cottage requires a quorum of 10 people reading it. Um, that, is, that is why outside of orthodox spaces, a transliteration, meaning Aramaic or Hebrew text written phonetically in English, um, is always provided so that people can read this, regardless of their understanding of the original language. As such, I'd like to request that everyone here attempts to read aloud the Mourner's Kaddish. In a moment, I'll set the pace. But a couple pointers before we begin are, um, for those reading the transliteration, if you see a CH, it is pronounced like ha. Um, if you struggle with that sound like I do, um, Feel, pre, feel free to pronounce it like you would an H. If you see an I, which is not next to any vowels, it's pronounced E, not I. So yitgadal. Um, again, please don't worry too much about pronunciation. Um, my grandmother is over 85 years old and I don't believe she's pronounced a single Hebrew word correct in her life. So it doesn't matter. Um, if everyone is ready, we'll start from Yit Barach. And we're going to go slowly for all the Jewish people in the room. Or Yit, yit Gadal, rather. Um, yit Gadal, the Yit Kadash, Shmei Rabbah, the Alma, Divra, Hirute, the Imlich Malhute. Bahaye hon, uv yome hon, uv haye de hol beit Yisrael. Baagala uv vizman karib, vimru amen. Yehe shme raba mevarach lelam ol ame al maya. Yit barach, be yish tabach, be yit paar, be yit roman, be yit nase. Vit Hadar, Vita La, Vita La, Shme de Kudisha, Birihu. Le La, mean cold, Behirata, Vishirata. Tush Behata, Venehemata, De Amiran, Ba Alma, Vimru, Amen. Yehe Shlama, Raba, mean Shemaya. Vihaim Alenu, Ve Kol Yisrael, Vimru, Amen. O say shalom, who ya say shalom, Alain, be a call Israel, Vimu, Amen. Thank you, everyone. Next up is O say shalom. It'll be on the back of your packet, so back here. And I'm going to grab my water before. And for any of you who may be on a time frame, feel free to but this is the last. After the solemnity of the Mourner's Kaddish, um, Ose Shalom is a prayer meant to transition people back into song. As such, I'm once again going to ask you to participate. Um, you already know the words to it, actually, as it's written, as it's the last three lines of the Mourner's Kaddish. 
uh, it's a really easy tune. It goes like this. Uh, oh, say shalom bim ramav, hu yase shalom aleinu, ve'akol Yisrael, ve'imru, imru, amen. Oh, say shalom bim ramav, Uyasi shalom aleinu ve'ako Yisrael ve'imru imru amen. Yasi shalom, yasi shalom, shalom aleinu ve'ako Yisrael yasi shalom. Yase shalom, shalom aleinu ve'anko Yisrael. There we are. Thank you. Thank you. if you hear people say something anti-Semitic or anti-people of color or any anti-anybody, anti say to them, what did you just say? And make them, you know, bring to their attention that it's not okay what they just said. That is the beginning of change begins with me. You can all take a sticker. Thank you for coming.